Welcome back to The Daily Poem here on the Close Reads Podcast Network. I'm David Kern. Today is February 10th, 2020. And on Saturday, February 8th, it was Elizabeth Bishop's birthday. She lived from 1911 to 1979, was an American poet, and uh, certainly one of the most gifted and important poets of the 20th century. She won the Pulitzer Prize in 1956, the National Book Award in 1970, and several other important awards. As I said, her birthday was on Saturday, February 8th, and given that, I wanted to share with you one of the the poems that I particularly enjoy by her, one of the more interesting poems. It's called The Moose. It's a little bit on the longer side, so I probably will not read it twice, but uh, I think it's uh, just one of her more um, intriguing, interesting, and dynamic poems, so I wanted to, to share it with you. So again, here is Elizabeth Bishop's The Moose, and this is how it goes. From narrow provinces of fish and bread and tea, home of the long tides where the bay leaves the sea twice a day and takes the herring's long rides, where if the river enters or retreats in a wall of brown foam depends on if it meets the bay coming in, the bay not at home, where silted red sometimes the sun sets facing a red sea, and others veins the flats lavender rich mud and burning rivulets, on red gravelly roads down rows of sugar maples, past clapboard farmhouses and neat clapboard churches, bleached, ridged as clamshells, past twin silver birches, through late afternoon a bus journeys west, the windshield flashing pink, pink glancing off of metal, brushing the dented flank of blue beat-up enamel. Down hollows, up rises and waits, patient, while a lone traveler gives kisses and embraces to seven relatives and a collie supervises. Goodbye to the elms, to the farm, to the dog. The bus starts. The light grows richer. The fog, shifting, salty, thin, comes closing in. Its cold, round crystals form and slide and settle in the white hen's feathers and gray glazed cabbages on the cabbage roses and lupins like apostles. The sweet peas cling to their wet, white string on the whitewashed fences. Bumblebees creep inside the foxgloves, and evening commences. One stop at Bass River, then the economies, lower, middle, upper, Five islands, five houses where a woman shakes a tablecloth out after supper. A pale flickering. Gone. The Tantramar marshes and the smell of salt hay. An iron bridge trembles and a loose plank rattles but doesn't give way. On the left, a red light swims through the dark. A ship's port lantern. Two rubber boots show, illuminated. Solemn. A dog gives one bark. A woman climbs in with two market bags, brisk, freckled, elderly. A grand night. Yes, sir, all the way to Boston. She regards us amicably. Moonlight as we enter the New Brunswick woods. Hairy, scratchy, splintery. Moonlight and mist caught in them like lamb's wool on bushes in a pasture. The passengers lie back. Snores. Some long sighs. A dreamy divagation begins in the night. A gentle, auditory, slow hallucination. In the creakings and noises, an old conversation. Not concerning us, but recognizable, somewhere back in the bus. Grandparents' voices, uninterruptedly talking, in eternity. Names being mentioned, things cleared up finally. What he said, what she said, who got pensioned. Deaths, deaths and sickness, the year he remarried the year something happened. She died in childbirth. That was the son lost when the schooner foundered. He took to drink. Yes, she went to the bad. When Amos began to pray, even in the store, and finally the family had to put him away. Yes, that particular affirmative. Yes. A sharp, indrawn breath, half groan, half acceptance that means, life's like that, we know it, also death talking the way they talked in the old feather bed, peacefully, on and on. Dim lamplight in the hall. Down in the kitchen, the dog tucked in her shawl. Now it's all right now even to fall asleep, just as on all those nights. Suddenly, the bus driver stops with a jolt, turns off his lights. A moose has come out of the impenetrable wood and stands there, looms, rather, in the middle of the road. It approaches. 
it sniffs at the bus's hot hood. Towering, antlerless, high as a church, homely as a house, or safe as houses. A man's voice assures us, perfectly harmless. Some of the passengers exclaim in whispers, childishly, softly. Sure are big creatures. It's awful plain. Look, it's a she. Taking her time, she looks the bus over. Grand, otherworldly. Why? Why do we feel, we all feel this sweet sensation of joy? Curious creatures, says our quiet driver, rolling his R's. Look at that, would you? Then he shifts gears. For a moment longer, by craning backward, the moose can be seen on the moonlit macadam. Then there's a dim smell of moose, an acrid smell of gasoline. So, it's a little bit long. It took me, uh, what, five and a half minutes to read the whole thing. And um, I'm not going to be able to read it again, but I'll read a few stanzas again. But I don't want it to give you a chance to be able to see it here for a second. So, it's, uh, it's 168 lines divided into 28 six-line stanzas. And the form of those stanzas is not um, terribly structured. Um, some of the lines are four or eight syllables, um, and then some are five or six. So there's a lot of variety in terms of that, that sort of thing. But there are some consistencies in terms of the, the way she stresses the lines and things like that. So if you, if you want to Google it and you want to spend some time really looking at the form, you can. One of the things that I particularly like about this is how, yes, on the one hand, it has a sort of stream of consciousness vibe to it, if you will. But also it has an incredible amount of um, meticulous detail. So at times the poem is holding back. You know, it's, it's making us kind of work and imagine and push ourselves into the scene. And then sometimes it's giving this great detail that pulls us into the scene. And, and I, I think a lot about how that's sort of how our imagination works. Sometimes we remember things with great detail and, and those details become the, the, the thing that represents the experience that we're having. And then sometimes they're merely impressions and we, we can't, you know, our consciousness is barely able to, uh, to uh, render any meaning out of them, let alone remember them in, in great detail. Um, and so the, the way this poem presents, the way memory works, the way imagination works, um, the relationship between detail and suggestion or between detail and impression is very interesting to me. Um, I'll, there's a couple stanzas that I want to read to you. Um, and I want to point out, uh, for example, that the first sentence takes the first one, two, three, four, five, six stanzas. So that's all one sentence. There are, of course, you know, there are semicolons and, and other end stops, but there's a lot of enjambment. It's pushing the narrative forward until you get to the point where someone is saying goodbye to their family with the collie dog supervising, and then they get on. And then the poem begins to shift. So we have a long first sentence, and then that next stanza in stanza eight it has a two-line sentence right away. Goodbye to the elms, to the farm, to the dog. The bus starts. The light grows richer. The fog, shifting, salty, thin, comes closing in. So in a way, the tone changes, and it changes in part because she changes some things formally. So she goes from this long William Faulkner, T.S. Eliot sort of stream of consciousness to one six-line stanza that includes four sentences as well as a semicolon and is much less impressionistic. So the whole tone changes because she makes that formal change. But then, of course, she swings back into the more impressionistic sort of stream of consciousness uh, sort of approach. So, for example, as people are falling asleep on the bus, she says this. Well, I'll, I'll read two stanzas here. Uh, I'll read three. Okay, so, a woman climbs in with two market bags, brisk, freckled, elderly. A grand night. Yes, sir, all the way to Boston. She regards us amicably. Moonlight, as we enter the New Brunswick woods, hairy, scratchy, splintery, moonlight and mist caught in them like lamb's wool on bushes in a pasture. The passengers lie back, snores, 
Some long sighs. Our dreamy divagation begins in the night. A gentle, auditory, slow hallucination. For what it's worth, a uh, divagation or divagation is a... Uh, another word for or it translates it comes from a french word i believe but it essentially translates to wandering probably comes from the latin first so a dreamy wandering begins in the night um and and so i've always wondered does the stuff with the moose is the stuff the conversation that she overhears coming next does that really happen or is this part of a dream and then on the other hand does it matter does it make it any less real I, you know does it make it any less meaningful if it's a dream or an impression or whatever. But it comes after she says, a dreamy divagation begins in the night, a gentle, auditory, slow hallucination, and then she has an ellipsis, dot, 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 leading into the rest of the poem. So she's making all these suggestions, asking all these questions, leaving all this to our own imagination. And so that draws us into it, even as at times we feel like we're maybe a little bit confused, which is in some ways the nature of dreams, the nature of imagination, the nature of... Uh, trying to express an impression of something. Um, so this is just a very interesting poem. I think it's a good example of uh, some of Bishop's talent and creativity. And so uh, on this February 10th, as we remember her birthday of February 8th, I thought I would share it with you. So with that, uh, this has been The Daily Poem. Thanks so much for listening, and I'll be back tomorrow.